to another episode of Grapples Academy, uh, reviewing more rolling footage this week with myself and Bon. Uh, just gonna sort of see we sort of tie up here from standing, working a little bit of the clinch. Uh, I don't know if you can see there, but Bon's collar ties feel like you've got about a thousand kilograms weighing off the top of your head. So I'm trying to do anything here to <laughs> alleviate some of that pressure. I think this was the round where you probably crushed me for about four or five rounds earlier and took a bit of pity on me and let me get the tight down. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I pretty much end up with going from like a two on one control there to like a. Uh, uh, it's not this round, is it? I can't remember, to be honest. So you can sort of see we're both just sort of playing with different configurations on a clinch. Um, so even though we're sort of we're putting a lot, quite a lot of pressure and pinch into it, we're still quite light and allowing each other to work as well. Um, so as you can sort of see, if there's the uh, really nice. Yeah. <laughs> Use that two on one control to uh, play around with an ankle, uh, ankle pick up into a single leg. And um, I wasn't really looking for anything in particular here because I think I still had control of the arm as well. And I was yeah. pinching, it, pinching the leg between the thighs. I think I just wanted to leg lock you here for a bit of fun. <laughs> I think you thought I was going to kick your back leg out. Um, but I was just playing around and trying to get a, a standing ankle lock or something funny just for a laugh. That's <laughs> why so I was like hopping around like mad, just trying to keep my back foot away from you. So just having to play around, nothing too serious. I'm not bothered if you get the take down or not, just playing with stuff. And then so I get some lovely uh, front head lock and snap down there again. Thumbs up to the camera. There's me signaling that I'm going to get battered again for another full round. <laughs> It's quite a habit I've just kind of built into myself here as well. When if I do get into that front headlock position, I'm typically more often than not looking for the back. And here I'm trying to tie up your hips here, so but you can't see my. I had my knee blocking your other knee. Ah, same. Yeah, same as that. But I was going over the hips and under the hips. <clears throat> I'm sure you just gave me the top position there. <laughs> but in terms of technique, it's legit. It's kind of like a two on one on the elbow and just driving over. Mm. I think at that point there, it was just a case of, I'm not doing anything. Sam Sai tried to turn me over several times in previous rounds, so I'm just, just going to make him turn me over. <laughs> yeah. And now the elbow justice. Oh, yeah, that pressure was in. brutal. This is a real dick move to be honest, because Simon's just very nicely let me get on top and have a, have a round underneath, and uh, the, the match was probably six or seven minutes or so, it's me just being a complete <laughs> arsehole. I remember when I was doing this, I was like, whatever I get, done to me off the back of this is completely justified. <laughs> um, so this is a thing I've been using quite a lot recently. The far arm control on the mm. neon belly uh, works really well because it stops people from pushing off on the elbow yeah. and it's really hard for them to rotate the hips or turn into it. Um, it also starts to set up the Kimura traps yeah. that you can use as well. But it just seems like it feels really isolating from the bottom. Oh um, yeah. Still got the control on the wrist there, even though Simon's turned over, so still controlling the position, even though the pressure's not down on top. And we've talked about this technique here with the shelving of the head on the thighs quite mm. a bit in previous videos. We used it to kind of like set up Kimura uh, from that like mounted north south position as well. It really sort of shuts down my movement here. Um, it's like the neon belly, um, personally, I try to avoid pushing across the body just because there's a lot of Das and Kimura setups from there. Um, so I usually just try and sort of wait it out and see what their next move is. <clears throat> um, plus, as well, I've seen Bond land that Kimura, uh, head that Dar, sorry, off the head and arm choke quite frequently, and I did not want to be on the receiving end of it. <clears throat> so, the game from the top is if somebody's in that mindset and they're waiting for you to move, make it as uncomfortable as possible from the top to give them an incentive. Yeah. Uh, this was like, you know. Probably about 50% pressure or so with, with the neon belly when it was on there. It was like nice and shallow across the hip. Um, you can be really nasty with it and drive the point of your knee yeah. into, the, into the sternum if you want to be an arsehole. Uh, but mostly what it's about being is just riding that top position and just kind of letting the opponent give enough of a reaction underneath that you start to wear them down over the course of the round. Ultimately, they're either going to get frustrated or start panicking and throwing limbs out. Simon doesn't here because he's experienced and he knows what the, what the setups and traps are, but I'll go straight back to that far wrist control again there. The other thing that this does really well actually, uh, with bolting the wrist to the floor next to the hip, it stops them from being able to shrimp out in that direction. Yeah. So it's all of my weight on top of him. 
and then Sai here is, uh, we had a bit of a chat about this after we rolled, so do you want to explain your thought process here when we're dancing with the leg? Yeah, so what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to disrupt Bond's base. Um, it does make it fractionally heavier on my stomach with the neon belly, but my rationale behind it was if I can make him feel unsettled and unbalanced while doing neon belly, it's going to force him to go somewhere else, which then creates a better opportunity for me to escape. Because um, you saw before he set up the dart attack, which was really like really tight. Um, what was all my thought process for that is shoulders to the mat and grab the bicep of the arm that's going to be doing a lot of the movement, just to shut down that movement there as well. Um, and it's basically try and bore you into changing tactics. <laughs> Well, my thought process on the receiving end of that was I'm just going to let Sai wear his arm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think I've got a really nice deep chin strap control yeah. here. It's quite often what I go for. So um, it's looking in tight and then come up for the uh, like 10 finger guillotine. Doesn't work. You roll out and then straight back to the belly with the wrist mm. control again. So just kind of cycling through the sequence here, straight back to playing with the knee. Um, <laughs> sort of see as well, it's very much a war of. Bond controlling and me just trying to get that inch back. Um, his top pressure is ridiculous and you can sort of see where he's setting up the gift wrap here as well. And a lot of my movement here is trying to free my elbow from underneath his armpit. And then a lot of the times I'll turtle up and then try and work my escape from there. Whereas this angle where we've got this where I've got the escape is where I do tend to find I can get more comfortable escapes, but Bond's doing a good job here of setting up some sort of crucifix control or isolate my arms anyway so it kind of limits my options. Yeah, so as Simon said, I'm, I remember in this round I wasn't really um, trying to control, uh, finish anything particularly. Um, it was more just about, like, we got rolled for a long time so I was trying to see what Simon's reactions were to some of the stuff that I've been setting up in the gym uh, over the past couple of weeks of rolling and uh, just getting a feel for a, a, a much more experienced player. And deal, you know, dealing with the situations that I've been practicing in the gym. So basically getting some reps in, uh, but also, you know, I, like we explained in the previous video, I'm kind of useless from the bottom uh, at the moment. So this is kind of a good way for me to drill with you and you to still get something out of it as well. Yeah. You know, putting me in my stronger position that I can do stuff um, rather than being completely useless underneath. And, you know, it gives us both a bit of a benefit there. So, so in my head, if, if I can get out from underneath your side control and the on belly, it's definitely going to improve my bottom escapes and defense. And like, event, usually what I'm looking for when I'm on bottom side as well is to try and get into half guard um, and then set up some sort of sweep from there. Or if I can try and get to butterfly guard, but it's usually a more of a difficult task, especially against someone who's more experienced. Whereas I can find that I can get to bottom half, play that lockdown game a little bit, or play that knee shield game, and just look for some sort of turnover to get back on top. So for me, these underneath positions, I noticed when we were rolling, you've got a good technique for posting up on the elbow and being able to swing back in and get a butterfly. Mm. Um, I think I had the gillet, like a chin strap position there, and you just did a really good job of rolling, and I thought I was gonna hang on, and I think that's you underneath, it's hard to tell, because we're both <laughs> got bald heads. Um, but this is kind of the beginning of the end of me being on top here. Still got the chin strap and it's tight enough that it stops Sai from moving, but it, it's not really doing anything here. Um, I think as well, like my deep half game, I'm not so much going for a we both kind of roll over kind of sweep. Um, the sweep I was looking for then was kind of isolating that leg and almost kind of rotating around that leg to come up on top and then get some sort of knee tap or something to get you on your back. Sometimes it creates a scramble, yeah. and controlling that scramble in the end does give you a bit more control on top. And now here's the point where I want to receive the end of whatever I deserved from that <laughs> eight minutes of top pressure, and, and Sai kind of puts me out of my misery rather than smashing me with some nail belly on the receiving end with a, with a straight arm lock. Um, quite a fun round, like I think we, uh, the end of this round was the last one I think that we did for the day. Mm. And, uh, yeah. We're kind of just talking a little bit about. Um, I think that's it now to explode for me. The bottom's really good at the moment because pretty much all rounds before this one on this day we've just gone straight through <laughs> yeah. without any breaks. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, go, uh, go again and meet you.
yeah, that was the kind of conclusion of that training session. Quite a good one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good um, to be. Yeah. So for me, at the moment, it's good for working those yeah, positions. I can't yeah. be explosive, but I'm trying to work on positioning, yeah. defensive position, creating the frames of my elbows and my knees, not letting people get in on those gaps on and side mm. control. We've not been able to bridge uh, too explosively. I've got to be really focused on position and putting myself in safe position. Yeah. So that's my main focus there. And um, no better person to do it than on the receiving end of somebody of size level. Yeah, the like, things that I've been working on uh, that arm lock that caught at the end is something that I've been working a lot on is isolating that far arm and so sort of either trying to find a submission from there or just seeing what I can do with it and see what everyone's reactions are. Um, and when I'm playing bottom, it's how awkward can I make it for the top player? So can I get them to sort of almost give up on what they're doing and create an opportunity for escape? Or can I get back to a stronger position and then look for some sort of sweep? And basically like, yeah, being in what you saw there was pretty bad position to be in for quite a while and... Um, kind of having that yeah. mental resilience, isn't it? To be underneath and kind of slowly work your position and then know that you know at some point there's going to be a gap if you keep working your techniques and you can come up and look to get a finish of yourself. But yeah. Importantly, like we talked about before, in those sort of situations, when you do come up out of being on the receiving end of an attack, your opponent could be tired, your opponent might not be tired, but it's important to go pretty much immediately onto the attack yourself rather yeah. than just kind of sitting there and going to neutral. And like you kind of get breath, get your breath back. Yes, you're going to be tired dealing with that sort of pressure underneath, but um, you need to go straight from rather than defence to neutral. Uh, defence to attack it and it yeah. oftentimes catches your opponent on the back foot and they're going to be less likely to be able to deal with something immediately like that rather than if you go to neutral and then it's fair game again yeah like I say and your part your opponent's still in that process of thinking about attacking they're not necessarily on the straight defensive mindset so you can capitalise on that it might only be a split second or one or two seconds where it takes a minute for them to readjust the tactics but you need to be faster than your opponent in switching those tactics up to make sure that you can catch them on the back foot and actually find something as well. <clears throat> and another nice thing that I like about these rounds that we've done, and it's quite often the case as well, yeah, we're both um, on the heavier end of jiu-jitsu players and we're both stronger, but there's not a lot of like real tight grip in it's like no. control by technique and, and pins and wedges and uh, legit technique rather than just smashing the shit out of each other for 40 minutes or however long it yeah. we rolled. Because you can see with your side control, you didn't use your typical cross face, you created a wedge in my head, you created a wedge at my hips, you created a blockade and that, that was what was pinning me. Like, you could have quite easily sat there and gone with the crushing pressure from top side control but you decided to just use wedges and blocking me from moving and my basically typical escape tools stop me from using them and you were still be able to you were still able to apply a great amount of pressure and another thing with that as well is like yeah the fundamentals of the blocks and the wedges that you're implementing will work against everybody but as well what you'll find a lot is with more ex inexperienced guys is they'll try and go in for that real heavy cross face pressure but it's uncomfortable for a little bit but actually because they've tied themselves so tightly to you it's quite easy to roll yeah and there's more escape option from the receiving end of somebody who knows what they're doing with the pressure you know always if you tie your opponent too tight to sorry if you tie yourself too tight to your opponent you're opening yourself up to be rolled and a lot of people who are inexperienced put too much weight over the top inside control tie themselves up too tight and it's very easy to get rolled but the mistake that they make when they don't know what they're doing is they turn around to you and say oh you just muscled me off yeah and it's not the case no because when you're underneath on that sort of pressure you can feel when somebody's coming over you too much and it's just kind of the tipping point it's like pushing them over the edge when they're already leaning yeah. um and, and that whole judo concept of using their own strength against them that's it like as soon as their hips come above or at the head or above the head in top side control the balance is all the way off and it doesn't take a great amount of strength like you may do an explosive roll but that was just it could have just been for flair you don't need to do a big bro big roll um especially as well if they start changing that angle but so going beyond that 90 degree angle where they're getting closer to being in a straight line with you you're gonna struggle to stay on top if that's the case
Cool, so we're going to get some more rounds filmed as well. If you want to see more of them, uh, we're going to film more of them for our, for our own benefit and just watching back. Um, probably what you should do if you've got the opportunity yourself. But if you want to see more of these rounds, comment uh, below um, and hit us up with anything else that you want to see as well. We discussed maybe whether we do uh, some commentary over uh, viewers' roles if you send them in. If that's something that you really want and you want us to do and go over your footage, uh, we might consider that in the future potentially as well. You probably have to bombard us pretty hard yeah. if you want that to be fair. Uh, but otherwise, subscribe to the channel so you stay up to date with the latest releases of the podcast. Like the video, share it with anybody else who's into uh, Jiu Jitsu or if they're not into Jiu Jitsu yet, send it them. Hopefully, it's exciting enough that they get in and they get bit by the bug. Uh, but otherwise, we're all at the Grapplers Academy, coached by side of Bonafide PT, and we'll see you next week. So make sure you like that, hit that like and subscribe button. <laughs> <laughs>